and governance is very clear. I recognize and appreciate them. May we be encouraged to embrace the nation. May we have high and the nation. Mr. President and fellow parliamentarians, you and I grow old when we give up on the most essential responsibility that sits on our shoulder. We are not here to aggrandize or empower ourselves. We are here to serve those who look to us to give them the shine of life. A man passed his 100th birthday just a week ago, too. The older of you knew the room will remember Henry Kissinger. He's turned 100 years, and in his 100th year, this American political leader signed the first copy of his book, Henry Kissinger's Leadership, Six Studies in World Strategy. In the heart of the book, he adds a critical perspective as to what makes for effective, good leaders who lead nations like prophets, he says. He said this, leaders need to see less from the perspective of the possible than from a vision of the imperative. Let me translate that for you. Less from the ambitions set out in their manifestos, but more from the imperative that faces us. The global order, said Kissinger, the global order is being shaken by unrivaled regions of conflict, intensified antagonism between powers with conflicting claims of legitimacy. The only way, he says, for a future to emerge is that we put aside our divisions and we do relentless diplomacy. You'll know as well as I do that nations are lining up at the moment as to whether they do or do not support centers of conflict. We don't need to name them. We know them. They're all over our news channels. We watch them with grief and we feel the agony of lives destroyed. Well, it wasn't that long ago, 1955, when 29 nations gathered in Indonesia. Those 29 nations included many of Africa's countries many emerging into new democracies. And at those 29 nations, there was a great debate as to whether or not Africa's countries face East or West. To whom do you look as the future emerges? Well, probably the smartest voice that was found to be gathered at that time was Kwame Nkrumah, soon to be Prime Minister of Ghana. And he rallied all of those present with the slogan, Neither East nor West, we face forward. Neither East nor West, we face forward. For all of us, the big challenge of the facing forward future is the final F, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because we cannot face forward if we do not forgive that which has transpired from the past. Forgiveness doesn't mean that the other person is right. But forgiveness liberates us. Forgiving other people is one of the greatest proofs of love. It's wiser to forgive and forget than it is to hate and remember. The practice of forgiveness is our most important contribution to the healing of relationships and to the healing and liberation of mankind. And Mark Twain, the clever writer, said this, forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds on the heels that has crushed it. Forgiveness is when I let you stand up irrespective of the wrong and still look you in the eyes with I say I need you because freedom only comes when forgiveness is birthed anew. In delivering, interpreting, and feeding us with the work of the future. I read a terrible story the other day called The Second Vulture. Some of you will remember 
the awful tragedy, not just of the fight in Sudan now, but the 93-94 famine. At that time, Kevin Carter, a South African photojournalist, a Pulitzer Prize winner for his journalism and his photography, took what was called the amazing shot. Some of you will recall this image of a tiny little girl, absolutely emaciated from lack of food and lack of water, her body bursting with her bones, desperate and broken, kneeling, crushed, trying to get to a feeding center and all alone. Behind her, a huge vulture, waiting with its gnashing claws and its huge beak about to claw her to pieces in order to eat what remains of her life. Kevin Carter took the picture. As he took the picture, he rushed away. I had a flight to catch, he said. He appeared on a radio program, savoring his great feet, thinking that he'd made such an exceptional photographic moment. He only lived sadly for another few months. But Kevin Carter took his life. He became depressed and committed suicide. His depression started deeply when he went on a radio program and he was asked this question. Why did you not pick up the little girl who was dying before you and take her to safety? His answer was, I didn't wait to find out what happened after the shot. I had a flight to catch. And the caller replied, I put it to you, Mr. Carter, that there were two vultures on that day, and one had a camera. How easy it is for you and I to observe the tragedies we witness, to simply see them as the events of others' responsibility, to determine that actually, as we live, we didn't do it, so we're not responsible. But I have news for you too. You and I are responsible. We are responsible for those who suffer and struggle, who cannot find their way to freedom because we may be holding back that critical key of forgiveness and renewal. For he who threw the stars into the skies and pleaded with his father before he returned again that we would be one, reconciled to one another, in forgiveness, facing those we perceive to be our enemies, willing to put aside what we think of our, as our positions, laying down as he did the grandeur of our estate and facing those we utterly dislike for the sake of our people, for the sake of our communities, for the sake of our nations, for the sake of our world, gathering together so that we may make peace a chance. We pray for maturity.